Okay, uh, this video is going to be about the simple issue with when or how did Paul die? Just asking the question. Uh, many people have different views about what they think it is, what the answer is. And uh, I'm going to show you to the right there. This is the clue. The solution was something that was uh, rediscovered in the 1600s. And it's a facsimile of Epistle of Clement from the Codex Alexandrinus. So this work was actually part of canon until 450 AD. And this is when this uh, Bible, it's called the Codex Alexandrinus, as I said, this is when it was rediscovered. And so between 450 and 16, in the 1600s sometime, the knowledge of how Paul actually died was removed from anybody's ability to know anymore. And it was in canon. It was a book in canon consistently from the very first century, 100, the, before 100 AD. This is, this is actually the oldest document that we knew that was in, I mean, absolutely we knew, but one of the oldest documents that had ever been recognized universally in Christianity. Nothing wrong with it. Well, there was one thing they didn't want you to know, so that it had to go. Okay, so we're going to ask a couple of questions to start the process of looking at what issues we're going to cover here, and you get the conclusions up front, so you'll know where we're going, and maybe uh, that'll help you uh, consider what kind of questions you would have if you have more than I have here. Just send them to me and, or put a comment sending them to me, and I will look into the other issues. When was the earliest report of Paul's death? Well, turns out we found out and by discovering of this book only in the, uh, only in the 1600s, uh, we found out it was first before 70 AD, sometime before 70 AD, because the uh, Epistle of Clement was written in, in, uh, in it, it references that the sacrifices are still going on at the Temple of Jerusalem, which was destroyed in 70 AD. So this had to be before 70 AD. So when it's one of the oldest documents of Christianity by its uh, own internal, uh, the, there's internal evidences of its actual date of before 70 AD. Was this report from the Bishop of Rome? Yes. It was. It was from Clement. He lived in Rome and had been its bishop for some time. And that's important, as we'll see. Um, was this the earliest and first report of first century a natural death, or was he martyred? The answer is, it was a natural death. Was the oldest claims of Paul being martyred instead from the fourth century, over 200 and some odd years later? The answer is yes. As first record of that, and they were, were they, were these fourth century accounts conflicting and self contradictory? And the answer is yes, they were. Was Paul's natural death in First Clement erased by removing it and destroying all copies? Yes, it's, well, here, oops, yes, because it's removed. This is the canon. We're looking at it on the right. The canon is Codex Alexandrinus, which until the Sinaiticus was found, uh, by Tischendorf in the 1800s, uh, this is all we this is all we knew. So what the next question is: What was the year that the Western Church recovered First Clement and could have this knowledge? In other words, this knowledge there's some knowledge in here about the death of Paul that by its destruction and removal, destruction of all copies, all copies are gone. All copies of First Clement are gone until what year? 1628. So something that had been part of the church as part of its canon, believe it or not, I mean, from before 100s all the way to 450, completely destroyed. And we know it was in the Codex because we, we've, we've dug it up since numerous times since 1628. We found it again and again and again in, uh, as, as you know, in scraps, you know, not in scraps, but in portions. And we know, therefore, it was very well used. Yet, think about this. This is destroyed. What explains the destruction of First Clement and all copies after the Alexandrian's full Bible of 450 AD? 
Well, we have four self-contradictory stories of martyrdom at Rome under Nero. Well, gosh, my goodness, wouldn't the best person to know what happened at Rome and if it was a martyrdom before Nero, be it somebody who was the bishop of Rome? Of course. So he would have known the truth if it were true that Paul had been martyred at Nero, by Nero at Rome, but that's not how he talks about Paul's death. What proves fraud behind the four accounts, these, these accounts that we're talking about that say Paul was martyred? Well, number one, Clement of Rome outlived Paul and resided at Rome, yet he testifies to a natural day that, quote, at length, as a prize of, quote, patience in Spain, not in Rome. Next, the second point is accounts are self-contradictory of his martyrdom, as even Chrysostom admits as he recounts them. They, none of them make sense. They're all inconsistent with each other, and they're supposedly he was killed by Nero. And we also have the fact that there's a strong tradition in Spain that, uh, that Paul went there to Spain before Paul died. So this matches what Clement is going to say is where Paul died. Okay, so uh, I think that'll, uh, that'll be enough for us to start our inquiry. Okay, so just for the record, we have uh, Clement of Rome. There's a picture of him here. And there's, this is a, a, in an article about uh, St. Paul went to Spain, question mark. This uh, author, this is in uh, earlychurchhistory.org. He is going to ask the question, did Paul do this? And he admits that uh, in Romans 15, verses uh, 15... Romans 15, verse 15 to 23. This is very, well, he, he punctuated this wrong. I think he means to say it's Romans 15, 23 to 28. And he says in there, Pan, Paul says, I plan to go to do so when I go to Spain. So Paul had an intention to go to Spain. And he's going to mention that uh, later, uh, Clement of Rome is going to say that Paul did go to Spain where he dies. So we're Okay, so let's take a look at some of the information we have about Clement, the first epistle of Clement. It's a letter addressed to Christians in the city of Corinth. But it's it's titled that it's a letter from the city of Rome to the Christians of Corinth. So it's clearly Clement is writing from Rome to the Corinthians. And the this is Wikipedia, by the way. Uh, based on internal evidence, some scholars say the letter was composed sometime before AD 70. Yes, no scholar would put it anywhere else because he's referring to the sacrifices at Jerusalem are still ongoing at the temple. So the temple has to be up. And that's destroyed in 70 AD, we know for a fact. So why would someone put that stray fact in there unless it was true? Now, remember, this is a epistle that's being covered up and hidden from your view. It has to be destroyed and taken out of the Bible because conflicting stories are arising in the 300s that tell a different story that Paul doesn't die in Spain, but he dies in Rome. And in Rome, it's supposedly a martyrdom, but in Spain, it's a death at long last, long length. Uh, he 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 uh, passes on. He goes he goes out of this world at long last and and receives the reward of patience. Patience is the kind of thing you get at death. Okay. So let's see. When was it deemed canon? When did it stop being canon? So this again is from Wikipedia on First Clement. The epistle was publicly read from time to time in Corinth, and by the fourth century, this usage had spread to other churches. So the letter goes to Corinth. They read it, they like it, and then that letter gets uh, copied and circulated. So now it starts from inside of Corinth, from inside of Corinth, which we can see here on this these maps here. This is a web page called Corinth Greece uh, Weebly.com. And so you can see that it is, see here, Athens, Corinth. So it's on the Greek uh, peninsulas. And it's an ancient city and actually looks like it has a pretty terrain. And uh, so we have a good map here. So it's part of the Greek, uh, 
speaking areas of the world. So uh, obviously we probably have a letter written in, in Greek, maybe also in Latin. Uh, so that's just another bit background fact about it. All right, so now we'll go back to uh, Wikipedia. So after that first sentence, it says it was included in the 5th century Codex Alexandrinus. 5th century means the 400s. So uh, most estimates are the Codex Alexandrinus is from the middle of the 400s, so around 450 AD. And for the longest time, this was the oldest Bible uh, Western civilization had uh, recovered very late in the 1600s. Okay. And this contained the entire Old and New Testament. And in that New Testament was the epistle, the, the epistle to Clement. And it's called First Clement because now we know of a second Clement, just so you know. Uh, it was included with the Gospel of John in the fragmentary early Greek and Agmaic Coptic papyrus, designated papyrus 6. So these are things that are discovered later. First Clement is listed. That means we don't have a copy of it when this information came out. Listed as canonical in Canon 85 of the Canons of the Apostles, showing that First Clement had canonical rank in at least some regions of early Christendom. And so, again, that would be consistent with what we're seeing in the Codex Alexandrinus, which is not really from Alexandrinus, it's from Byzantium, it's in Constantinople handwriting, the way they wrote there in that time. And then somebody named, and I hope I don't do this wrong, uh, Ibn Kadun also mentions it as part of the New Testament, suggesting that the book may have been in wide and accepted use in either the 14th century Spain or Egypt. So that person is somebody who would be speaking from within 14th century uh, Spain or Egypt, but it's now in outlier areas. It's no longer at the heart of Christianity. It's no longer uh, known uh, by people in the West. We don't have any clue that there's this epistle that would tell a different story about Paul's death and be much earlier than the accounts that we're looking at. So the idea gets permeated through the Western church, Roman Catholicism, uh, and that Paul died as a martyr. And Part of it is they built, uh, they made statues in, in Rome later, you know, to co coincide with the new story, the new narrative. And uh, we have to know that Paul appointed, when he was in Rome awaiting his trial, he appoints somebody to be the bishop of Rome, not Clement. And then Peter replaces that person. But that means that, and I think it was Linus was the person's name. And that just means that Paul had an integral role in the line of bishops of of uh, of Rome, even though Peter replaced this person, maybe didn't like Paul's choice. Let's, let's be honest. What what else could explain that? But anyway, the point is, Paul the the image of the Roman Catholic Church could depend upon making sure that Paul doesn't come out a bad guy. All right. So since this says, in essence, when you read this article, the, the uh, oldest record we have of it is the Codex Alexandrinus uh, until some much, much later discoveries in the 1800s and 1900s uh, of, of scraps where we can find it now. And we know that it was in more ready circulation. Uh, so what about the Codex Alexandrinus? Let's look into that. When, when did we receive that? So this is the article Codex Alexandrinus. And it says, Though known from antiquity, the first document to contain the Epistle of Clement and to be studied by Western scholars was found in 1628, having been included with an ancient Greek Bible given by the Patriarch Constantinople of Constantinople, Cyril I, to King Charles I of England. So this is 1628, as we said in our opening. The first complete copy of First Clement was just rediscovered in 1873. So that's almost 200 and some odd 50 years later, some 400 years after the fall of Constantinople. I don't know why they're mentioning that. When Philo, well, Philolaeus Berenios found it in the Greek Codex Herosolimitanus, written 10th 56. Okay, so I guess what they're saying is when Constantinople fell, that would be. Uh, when the I think the uh, Islam conquered Constantinople, uh, somebody found at that time during that siege, I guess Philo Philotheos Berenios found it in a Greek codex Her Hero Silomitanus written in 1056. So there was evidence 
that uh, was still in one of the codexes as late as 1056 AD, some, but it's in Greek and apparently very limited. So it, it was, you have to imagine that there's many, 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 many Bibles and it's been systematically destroyed. In other words, so that it would be this, this unknown, because again, it has a story in it that nobody wants to remember. People have erased it and created new narratives that are important for uh, theological reasons uh, in their mind. Whoever's doing these stories have a theological purpose for making Paul look good. And this is happening in the 300s, as we'll see. Uh, this work written in Greek, you know, we're talking about this Codex Hero Salaminitinus, was translated into at least three languages in ancient times. A Latin translation from the second or third century was found in the in 11th century manuscript in the Seminary Library of Namur, Belgium, and published by the by Germain Maureen in 1894. So we were starting to see, aha, this was in existence before the second the the second century means the 100s, 100 to 199. Third century means uh, 201 to 299 that i know this sounds weird but that's how it works so th this is before these stories start circulating in the 300s of a martyrdom this book is telling a different story and we're going to show you the words uh and then a, a syriac manuscript now at cambridge university was found by robert lubuck bensley in 1876 of the same book. So in other words, it's coming out of the woodwork. It's coming out of the uh, scholarship of the late 1800s. Uh, he, and it was translated in English in 1899. And then a Coptic translation, which means I think it would be that's Egypt, has survived in two papyrus copies, one published by C. Schmidt in 1908 and the other by Mr. Roche in 1910. So it's now well established. We can find that it was going on in those earlier time periods, but it's obviously been extinguished, removed from scripture for no good reason other than the fact that it's going to not say something people, people don't want to hear what it has to say, I believe, about Paul. And, and so it goes from its first recent when was it first discovered from the ash heap of history? That's, that's exactly where it went. It went into the ash heap, this wonderful book. And, um, and so we can see that, I uh, just want to show you Paul's missionary journey to Spain, tradition and folklore. So, uh, oh, excuse me. So uh, now a lot of people don't like the fact that uh, you can prove that he went to Spain and that you can be proven from the people who lived in Spain and left records behind of this because then that would um, do that. Now, what's the, uh, if Paul did die at Nero's hands, Nero, who is Nero? Because this is what the myth is going to be later in the 300s. So I just want to give us an outside date of when this would have had to happen. So we've shown you Clement is writing before 70 AD because he mentions the, the uh, sacrifices at Jerusalem. Well, Nero commits suicide in AD 68. Let's read the story. When the Roman senator Vindex rebelled with support from the eventual Roman emperor Galba, Nero was declared a public enemy and condemned to death in absentia. He fled Rome, and on the 9th of June, A.D. 68, he committed suicide. His death sparked a civil war. Okay, so Paul, if he had been uh, tried, it would have been at Rome where Nero exists and uh, lives, and it would have been before 68 A.D. So this, and who, where does, where does Clement live? He lives in Rome. So if anyone should know it was a uh, execution, a martyrdom, it would have been Clement. So the fact that Clement says it isn't a execution or martyrdom and is something quite different, that we therefore know this is a person who would have had knowledge had it been a martyrdom at Rome under the hands of Nero before 68 AD because he, Clement, is the bishop of Rome. He would know something so obviously important and, and material. Okay, so let's go a little bit more here. In the article on First Clement, it talks about the authorship and date. It says, although traditionally attributed to Clement of Rome, the letter does not include Clement's name and is anonymous. So like many things, you just have to look at the title of the letter in the book. So it says, for, it says it's Clement. 
continues and it says the epistle is addressed as the church of god which sojourns in rome to the church of god which sojourns in corinth that's in greece and the stylistic coherence suggests a single author okay so now i want to show us that we can make a good inference that first clement is being removed uh, from the four, 400s forward from canon because why it's conflicting with what there's something in it that they don't want to be preserved. And so we can see just here by putting the articles in Wikipedia, first epistle of Clement side by side with the articles on Codex Alexandrinus, we can see that it, this is going to first emerge it was included in the fifth century Codex Alexandrinus. This, this is when it first comes back to our attention a work from 450 AD is going to be the last document that's allowed to have even existed where First Clement is considered part of canon. And then canon is systematically removed. It remo it's removed from all canon copies after this. And then it's only because this book was given to England in the 17th century, down here in the article, uh, and then reprinted in 1657 that we have any knowledge at all I think it was given to the church in 1628, as I recollected, or given gave that date earlier. So this is a very, very much suppressed epistle. It's not an accident that it disappears. Why would you get rid of this, a very good epistle? Why would you get rid of this epistle, one of the oldest and earliest epistles of the church by the founder of the, not founder, but by the bishop of, of, of uh, Rome? unless there's something you don't want to have in it. So tradition should have kept it in there, but there's something more powerful than your tradition. There's controlling the narrative. So I want you to see uh, how or when Paul died. And we're going to, uh, we've typed up, not typed up, but we've blocked and copied it from another text. I want to show you the website that comes from before we continue. So here is the source. It's early Christian writings, first Clement, Clement of Rome, first epistle, translated by Charles Hood, 1885. Okay. And uh, that's going to be important. And we're going to look down here, show you it's going to come out of chapter five. And it's these remarks here. He's also going to talk about Peter. We're going to show you how he describes a martyrdom, somebody who's actually killed, um, uh, murdered versus someone who dies naturally, which we'll see over here. And I'm going to just, I've copied these texts over so we can read them uh, more easily. Uh, so we will be right back. Okay, so first Clement, written prior to the temple fall in 70 AD and once part of Christian canon, says Paul died a natural death as reward for patience. Uh, chapter 5, verse 5. Through N.B. Paul II showed by example the prize that is given to patience. Seven times was he cast into chains. He was banished. He was stoned, having become a herald both in the East and in the West. He obtained the noble renown due to his faith. Verse 7, and having preached righteousness to the whole world and having come to the extremity of the West, that is Spain most likely, and having borne witness before rulers, he departed at length out of the world and went to the holy place, having become the greatest example of patience. And this is the Bishop of Rome giving the last place that Paul lived when he died and, uh, at, and, and he departs at length out of the world. This is not something that happens at a moment in time. It's something that took time or length for him to die, to pass away. And it's occurring in Spain, not in Rome, where, the, where this bishop lives. So there's nothing about Nero in this. Nero is excluded from this statement by definition, and any kind of uh, death by sudden beheading is given up by the fact that this death involves patience. It's going to happen at length, out, and he's going to go out of the world at length, and it'll be the greatest example of patience, meaning he patiently endured this, this probably a last illness that is then renowned, and it occurs in Spain, not in Rome. The death is not a sudden beheading in Rome, as we'll later be the claim. And then uh, to show you the contrast, Clement is going to tell you that Peter, we all know, or it, appear, it appears Peter was martyred, and that's the, the way it's going to be described here when he talks about Peter in just the prior passage to that. Peter, through unjust envy, endured not one or two, but many labors, and at last, 
not at length, but at last, confer, I put in there, confer at length for Paul, having delivered his testimony, departed unto the place of glory due to him. And so this is talking more about a death that involves glory as well, if you think about it. So Peter death, Peter's death is not due to patience for death at length, but instead was a departure at last when he departs for heaven. Hence, one dies, uh, one who dies was an example of patience at length in Spain, at the extremity of the West, meaning Paul, but the other person he's describing, Peter, departs at last after delivering his testimony. So that's martyrdom. So you can see how he's talking about somebody who's martyred, and you can see how he's talking to somebody who hasn't been martyred. So one person's uh, receiving uh, glory for his martyrdom, and the other is receiving his basically his reward due to patience at length, departing at last out of the world at the extremity of the West, meaning Spain. That's the extremity of the Western Empire, if you if you think of it that way. So, yeah, this is totally not what they want you. This has to be hushed up and hidden away and, and buried and destroyed. And literally, had we not received it in the 1600s, it wouldn't have been found for another 200 years uh, when it's dug up little pieces and here and there. And then finally, by the middle 1800s and then and early 1900s, we were finding m many more copies of the same document. Okay. Okay. Now I want to turn to one of the articles on our website it's called A Review of a Polite Bribe. So somebody did a movie uh, called The uh, Polite Bribe. And in this tries to set up a claim that uh, James, the Bishop of Jerusalem, had Paul arrested in Acts 21. Uh, he was really behind orchestrating Paul's getting arrested uh, at the temple. And he doesn't tell you what the charge was, so you don't know what he means by that. But what uh, Luke records is that Trophimus was claimed by the Jews to have violated the middle wall of separation at, the, at the, the Temple of Jerusalem and entered and defiled the Holy of Holies area of the church by being an uncircumcised state. And uh, anyway, so he is his alleged uh, role in what Trophimus did, which Paul said, Paul had an alibi, which was I was only doing a ceremonial bath when that happened with Trophimus, so don't blame me. So he had an alibi. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, but these people were accusing him of having brought Trophimus in the temple in the first place. So they're blaming him for the ultimate outcome. And, uh, anyway, neither here nor there. That's a whole nother complex story. But anyway, so, uh, this movie was trying to blame James for what, what ends happening. And he believes the, the author, whoever this was, and I think in, in hindsight, I'm beginning to think it was Robert Orlando who wrote a book, <laughs> the polite bribe and is the producer of this movie. So he's probably the one who made this mistake and it was a significant mistake. So he was trying to claim that we should view James, the Bishop virtually as guilty of murder of Paul, because he set it up that Paul would be arrested, tried, sent to Rome and executed and beheaded there. So he assumed without proof that Paul had been executed as a result of this first trial. But here I have on the screen for you to see Eusebius and Jerome both record that Paul was acquitted by Nero at, in this trial. Eusebius makes it emphatic that Paul was, quote, absolved of all crime. This is in Eusebius's ecclesiastical history uh, from 325 A.D., the Edward, Edwin, uh, excuse me, the Cruz edition of 1905 at page 62. It's also cataloged as Book 2, Chapter 12. And then we have more on that in a footnote. And then Jerome says the same thing. So there's no, unquestionably the early church understood that Paul was acquitted in that first trial in front of Nero. And then I review here the source we've been talking about, the, uh, the book of Clement. So just so you know, my motivation for doing this thorough research to determine the answers to these questions was not because I was trying to deprecate Paul at all. It just so happens it does. And again, shock of shocks, the church has manipulated history. The Roman Catholic Church, I should say, who has a stake in Paul's uh, reputation, they have manipulated history to change history so that, and get rid of canonical books so that you wouldn't see something that, that you would think otherwise. Why would we get rid of the, the epistle to Clement? I mean, don't we want to keep something like that? Because just by tradition alone, something that's been in the Bible from the earliest 70 AD period or earlier, 
all the way to, you know, the 400s? Why would you get rid of something like that? At least let's have a decision. But, you know, it's just removed and, and it's gone. Uh, anyway, w we have other evidence that Paul went to Spain and that that was a very well-known fact, uh, probably from the book of, of uh, Clement, but these are independent references to Paul being in Spain. So that kind of corroborates where Paul dies when you think about it. So this is what people most remember at the time. They're talking about somebody who's dead and gone and they keep remembering he went to Spain and that's the last thing they mention. So again, this corroborates that Paul died there and that's what everybody understood and nobody thought he died at Rome and was beheaded there. It later becomes a myth. The Muratorian canon scrap from the second or fourth century. So there's a dispute where, when this was dated. Is it the early 100s? Is it the 300s? Uh, he record, it records a trip by Paul to Spain that's never mentioned in Acts. It says, quote, Paul, who from the city of Rome proceeded to Spain. So this is, again, how would you read this? You'd read this. Why would that be the one remark they make in this Muratorian canon? It must be that's where they think he died and le left this earth. Uh, instead, uh, now, Luke records, once Paul arrived to Rome to stand trial, he was allowed to live in the house for two years at his own expense thus far. That's Acts 28, 30 through 31. So the last canonical place we knew he was was in Rome awaiting trial before Nero. But I've already told you he was acquitted on that, which means he's allowed to leave. He's allowed to go wherever he wants. And where does he want to go? And And so this probably was around 64 AD, which is about the time of his death. But the best estimates is that's about the same time. So he's he's w awaiting trial. I think he's he goes to Rome at about 60 and he dies probably uh, two years later. And he's already he's, you know, excuse me, he's he's living in Rome for two years by the time X-20 concludes and he dies about two years later is what I'm getting at. So um, now so he was under house arrest. Um Interestingly, this trip to Spain, which obviously was after the close of Acts and which only could follow an acquittal, remains a strong tradition in Spain. And I showed you that. It's also recorded in early non-canonical works, including the Acts of Peter and the Acts of Xanthippe. So you have multiple old ancient sources saying Paul went to Spain. And, it, and again, these are written after he's passed away, right? So why, why are they referencing he went to Spain? It's because that's the place he's last known to have been. So they're they're making a memory consistent with the span the memory of the Spanish people. Okay, and I told you about that. Now, Chrysostom. So we're going to get to the the next issue, which was were there stories that replaced the the truth? And so lies be, lies and myths become fact, and they screw they screw they scrooge out or or they push away the truth and the truth has to be destroyed then that's really have to understand you can't leave you can't leave uh uh this epistle of clement alone you have to get rid of it you have to take it out of canon you have to destroy as many copies as you can possibly find this is a this is something that christians do not understand the roman catholic church was brilliant at propaganda and and creating a narrative that would fit what they wanted and they didn't care if something was canonical or not these are not my peer, my view is, friends, I hate to tell you, there's something unchristian inside the Roman Catholic Church that didn't care about Christ, didn't care about Clement's epistle, didn't care about canon. It's always they have to win and they have an agenda and they can destroy texts. They can they can manipulate truth to come out to support things that are heretical themselves. So let's just read, though, what Chrysostom says. In 398, so this is basically 400 AD, 398, he says, from what he understood, Paul went was set at liberty at Rome, then went into Spain, homily 10. So that's what that says. And then came to Jerusalem. So he mentions in another homily, came to Jerusalem and made a visit to Jewish believers there, and then he came to Rome where he was put to death. Nero, uh, the works of Nathaniel Lardner, 1815, volume 2, 607. But you can't just take say, well, that's the end of that. You know, what What does Chrysostom fully say? So this is how it will be presented to you, and you would think, oh, well, that's that's what happened. Well, then you got to go read Chrysostom. Why is he say, saying that? Because he's going to say all the other stories. Okay, so that's where you have to know. So you, if you read just page 607 of that book, you're going to not get the full picture. But if you go all the way to 619, you're going to get the full picture. But that's not the only story.
So then you have to ask yourself, why are there all these different stories? If it happened, it's a happened. Why would there be many different accounts of the same thing for different reasons? All in conflict. So Chrysostom knows this, and he explains the various options of stories of why Nero executed Paul on the return visit. So this return visit never happened. I'm just pointing that out. I mean, who better than the epistle writer of Clement of Rome, its bishop would have known where Paul died. He believes he died in Spain. That's very clear. To the extremity of the west of the empire is, is Spain. That's where he thinks it happened. So let's see what the options are. Uh, and and uh, at the time, I was trying to prove Mr. Uh, the, the producer of Polite Bribe had made a mistake claiming that Paul died in the first trial. So I'm always trying to also prove that here in this article. None of them involve charges raised in Acts 21. So Paul is not going to be executed for anything that happened at the temple with uh, Trophimus, which is what's going on in Acts 21 through 26. That that accusation, that trial, that appeal all involve Trophimus and pr primarily, uh, and also uh, did he was he being disruptive to Judaism by bringing in this person in the first place? Was he being antagonistic? That could probably was a secondary issue. Uh, or at least that's how, how some people view it. Uh, so the first option is Nero did this because Paul had converted his favorite concubine. So he has a favorite concubine. He, cha he changes her to Christian and Nero's upset. So he's going to arrest Paul. And uh, I guess because Paul had converted her. So now he's going to arrest her and kill him. That's one story. Then a different story was that Nero killed Paul because Paul saluted a butler or a cupbearer and a concubine of Nero. So now it's really sounds to me like there's really three stories in one. He salutes somebody. He, you know, raises his hand. Hello. One story is it's a butler. Another story, it's a cupbearer. And the third is it's a concubine of Nero. So now we're getting a conflation of myth. And, and this is what happens when you're telling a lie. It just, people repeat the same lie different ways. And it doesn't really all, you know, they're, they're waiting for it to land. What will you believe? I'll tell you as many different accounts as possible. And the third story was that Paul converted a cup bearer of Nero. Okay, so now that appears just limited to the cup bearer, but it, instead of him being saluted and that leading to his death, this is he converted the cup bearer to Nero. So now he's going out in a virtu more virtuous way than just saluting someone. There, he led someone to Christ and then uh, Nero retaliates. Finally, and so I've made it sound like it's four stories, but I think there's more than four. There's probably seven stories in this whole scenario. Finally, a fourth story was that Nero killed Paul because Paul found favor with one of the friends of the emperor. So there's a friend of Nero, and Paul is liked by this friend, and so Nero retaliates by, by killing Paul. That doesn't even make sense, right? Your friend likes Paul. You should be persuaded that maybe you should listen to Paul, not kill him. So this doesn't give a motive for death. None of these things are motives to kill people. But saluting someone, is that a motive to kill someone? I mean, Nero is a crazy person. Nobody doubts that. But killing people is a big deal in, in the world. You know, if you're an emperor, you should be cautious about who you kill and you don't kill. And they should you should really have a good reason for it, even if you're mur you're uh, you're bent on murder anyway. But the none of these work to 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 make any sense. So these are nonsensical claims of murder. N you know, and he's got enemies everywhere. So if you want to murder anyone, why don't you murder people who are your enemies, who are political enemies? Paul's not a threat to you. So all of these accounts are inconsistent with each other, and all of them make no sense. And are, they're self-contradictory and they contradict the earliest account that Paul died in Spain at long la at long length and, and he was given the reward of patience which suggests it was a long protracted illness and he went out of the world which is way how you would talk about someone who dies in the natural way and not uh okay anyway so anyway I, I don't think we can give it any truth whatsoever all right, so let's review our original, our opening of the uh, video today was to show you some questions and answers. We're going to review them again to make sure we've covered everything and to uh, remind you of each point of evidence that we found. When was the earliest report of Paul's death? It was before 70 AD. Was this report from the Bishop of Rome? Yes, it was from Clement. 
Was this earliest and first report of the first century a natural death? Yes, we saw that this was something that happened uh, at length and was a reward of patience. He was given, he was allowed to die. And it occurred in Spain, which is going to be completely at odds with all the uh, multiple contradictory accounts we'll see later. So this, this is clearly a natural death in Spain. Was the oldest claims that Paul was martyred instead from the fourth century? And the answer is yes. We, and we saw they're all over the map. Were the fourth century accounts conflicting and self-contradictory? Yes. They, you know, not one of them are consistent with the other one. Um, they just, you know, you, concubine is, uh, uh, somebody is saluted. Is it a butler? Is it a concubine? Is it uh, some other person that leads to death and another person is converted who's a, uh, a cupbearer and that leads to death? I mean, they, none of them are consistent. Was Paul's natural death in First Clement? Or, oh wait, hold on. So yes, were the accounts conflicting and self-contradictory? Yes, that's your first evidence that they're not true. Uh, besides the fact he dies in those accounts all at Rome, when one thing is clear, Clement says he died in, at the extremity of the West, which is consistent with a whole bunch of external documents that, pay, that always mention Paul went to Spain as, as if that's the last they knew of him. That's where he, he went. So it's all consistent. Clement is backed up by multiple other sources. Was Paul's natural death in first Clement erased by removing it and destroying all copies? That's a, an emphatic yes. Think about the systematic destruction of what used to be part of the, the Bible. So it's not like if the if the letter of Clement had just existed and was never part of a bigger document and a part of a bigger history, it would just be a letter. And it would be a letter that was circulated to a few people and disappeared. This is not that kind of thing. This is a letter that was adopted as part of Christian canon, meaning publications. Not that people had made a decision at a canon hearing or something like that. This is just something that by a matter of practice was put in the Bible all the way through 450 A.D. And then disappears completely? Come on. Why? Because of all these alleged accounts that Nero killed him in Rome. Instead of what Clement is saying, he dies in Spain at long, uh, at length. Okay? And he, then he goes out of this world. An expression that would indicate it's a natural death. So they don't want that. That has to be expunged. And this shows you the power of the Roman Catholic Church and the way it handles truth. It doesn't like it, just destroys it, and it doesn't care if it's in the Bible. They'll destroy the truth, even if it's accepted by everyone in the Bible and revered and, 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 and held in highest honor. And I'm not saying it's an inspired work at all. I'm just saying it's just a, it just was something that was a, a, a wonderful marker inside the church and it has a lot of interesting moral lessons it talks about you know the people used to be obeying the commandments and now they're not doing that and they need to get back to that i mean he's got all kinds of important things that would give us insight on how the earliest church thinks don't you think that would just be something you would never remove you know it, it should be it should have become sacrosanct but because it violates what the roman catholic church wants to perpetuate now in the 300s after their con corruption by Constantine, now we have to elevate Paul. He, Paul can't die a natural death anymore. He's somebody who teaches us against following Sabbath, teaches us apostasy as a principle that we can adopt here at Rome, which is exactly what's going to happen. This church believes that they can move the day of the rest from Shabbat to the day of the sun because their leader, Constantine, is a believer of the God of the sun. Saul Invictus, it's on all his coins. He's, it says on the coins that he is the friend of Saul Invictus. These are even public. Paul, after, after Constantine claimed, Constantine claims he had this vision of Jesus in three, uh, I'm going to say 315 AD, and yet he's public, he's doing these coins, you know, at 317, 321, with him depicted with Saul Invictus on one side, and then on the other side, it's uh, himself, and it says, and the scribe says, he's a friend of Saul Invictus. I mean, come on. He's a, he's a pagan, yet the Christians are, are being told he's not, and, and it's that's a whole other narrative that's going on at the same time. He is pressuring us to be pagan as much as possible. And that's what he accomplished at Nicaea. He made us go completely pagan, making God have a substance that he could share with another being. And then by sharing his substance with Jesus, Jesus becomes eternal and a God from eternity. 
and we can then worship Jesus as God, and the which fits Sol Invictus. The Son of God is Sol Invictus in the Roman religion, and Sol Invictus is also known as Apollo in the Greek religion. So this is this is all going on simultaneously. We are being forced into paganism. We are being pressured into paganism, and everything that could help support paganism and apostasy from God's law has to be elevated. So Paul can no longer die in Spain. No, Paul can no longer die at length in Spain. Paul can no longer go out of this world in Spain. He has to die at Rome as a martyr so we can make a hero out of him and make him more important than he was in his own day. That's what's going on. All right. I hope that helps everybody get a better perspective on history. History is important in order to understand the truth about what we are looking into the Bible. We are given a focus or a lens that misleads us at every turn. We're never told certain things were changed and manipulated and we're in canon, but now we're out. And then we're not told why they were out. We're not shown these, these, these passages. And I'm going to even tell you the way that uh, third parties have summarized what I just told you. They, they've, uh, they've changed the way that translation occurred. So you don't, you don't really get it anymore just to tell you. So sometimes you just have to realize Everything you think is true has been manipulated. And in, as uh, it says in 1984, how do you control the future? You control the past. How do you control the past? You control the records. That's what the the party of Big Brother tells uh, Winston. Contro if you want to control the future, you got to control the past. And how do you control the past? You control the records. So by destroying records, rewriting the narratives, uh, I think in the movie, in the play, in the story, the book, in 1984 is the new narrative is that we were never at war with Occitania and, you know, we're, and instead we've always been at war with another country. So they just rewrite history. And, and he's saying, but I don't remember it that way. I remember it some other way. And they, and they're telling him, you have to accept we're telling what we're telling you as the truth of history. And that's uh this is a perfect proof of that going on in our own, in our, our own world. Our own world is a product of fraud, of massive proportions, because who Paul is has created a massive impediment to having people follow Jesus Christ. People believe in dispensationalism, that Jesus' words don't matter. Only Paul's words matter. That's the new, the new normal. And, you know, and, uh, Jesus' gospel was rejected by the Jews, supposedly. That's not even true. Not even remotely true. It's the opposite. Paul, Paul was a nobody when he dies. His gospel isn't accepted. And that's we've shown you time and time again. That's the truth. When you look at the book of Acts and you look at what that was for, that was just to win a trial, an appeal at Rome. It had nothing to do with Paul. And the actual real church is getting tens and myriads of thousands coming to Christ. And Paul has maybe 43 mentioned in the book of Acts. And for 14 years before those accounts, he has no nothing to show for it. So, you know, put some perspective here, people, but we're never, we're never explained the big picture. So we got to go one little fact at a time and go deep and look at the detail. You got to unravel all these lies. You got to go through it one little question at a time and keep asking the right question and getting the right answers. And then you can build a new narrative, which is the truth. And how are we getting the new narrative? Because God divinely is allowing us to see the bits and pieces that have been suppressed in history. And he is now revealing it in these last days. So we get warned before the time of the end that we are then prepared to know who is on the side of Christ. Those who follow Jesus and who's not on the side of Christ, the dispensationalists who follow only Paul. And what's the challenge for all the people? The, ma the great mass of Christians in the middle is to make a decision between Jesus or Paul. That's where you probably are right now. And you think you can choose both. No, if you choose, Jesus said he's the sole teacher, the sole pastor. And that's what we need to follow. That's in Matthew 22. He says it twice. Okay, God bless. Take care, everybody. Ciao. Bye.